accompanied by Maestro Ryan Kayabyab, bringing us the joy of Christmas with two of Miss Maestro Kayabyab's original compositions. Ladies and gentlemen, the Upma Squire and Maestro Ryan Kayabyab. Sanggol, kalung-kalung ng iyong ina. Munting sanggol, may ningning ang iyong mga mata. Matid mo bang kay raming naghihintay sa'yo? Nananapit ng pagsilang mo. Mga pastol, sa sapsapan ay nagpupugay. Nagpupugay.
Squire tonight accompanied by the one and only Maestro Ryan Kayabya. Thank you once again to the Upma Squire and to you, Maestro Kayabya. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the Mu Sigma Phi sorority in celebration of its 85th year. In cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. 
This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen, or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. The webinar will begin in 10 minutes. Please stand by. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the Mu Sigma Phi sorority in celebration of its 85th year, in cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. 
This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UP Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the live stream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila live stream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen, or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. webinar will begin in five minutes. Please stand by. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the Music Mafi Sorority in celebration of its 85th year, in cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Music Mafi Foundation. 
The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder, and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UB Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the live stream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila live stream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen, or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. Good morning, everyone. I am Julie Gabatan, New Sigma Physiority Batch 2012, speaking in behalf of the Aging and Longevity Webinars team of the New Sigma Physiority. We are streaming live from the video conference room of the UP Manila Information Management Service. Our time in Manila now is exactly 12.01. For today's web webinar, we are, we are privileged to have a very distinguished alumna of the UP College of Medicine, Class 1980. She finished her residency in internal medicine and clinical fellowship in nephrology in UPPGH in 1984 and 1985, respectively. She then pursued a master's in, clinical, in, sci master's in science in clinical epidemiology in the University of the Philippines in 2012. Currently, she is the Vice President of the Philippine Society of Nephrology, the Chief of Section of Nephrology in Manila Doctors' Hospital, Professor in the Department of Physiology of the UP College of Medicine, and the Secretary of the Board of Regent of the Philippine Society of Nephrology. She served as the Head of the Section of Nephrology of UPPGH from 2007 to 2012. 
and the chair of the Department of Physiology of the UP College of Medicine from 2013 to 2018. In 2013, she was awarded the Philippine Society of Nephrology Special Award for Medical Education and was also recognized as Exemplar Awardee for Medical Staff by the Manila Doctors' Hospital in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud and honored to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Montemayor, New Sigma Phi Sorority, Batch 98. Thank you very much. And indeed, it is my honor to be part of the Aging and Longevity Medical Ser me medical webinar series. And it is indeed also my honor to bring forth to you the, the topic of taking care of the aging kidney. Indeed, this is a very timely topic. So my objectives for this lecture are to enumerate the methods to estimate kidney function, to describe the structural and functional changes that happen to the kidneys with aging kidneys. I'm going to talk about the microscopic and macro Microscopic changes and the changes in the glomerular and tubular functions. And lastly, I'm going to discuss the ways of taking care of our kidneys. So I'm going to begin this presentation with the case of a 70-year-old male who's very physically active. He still plays basketball, has no hypertension, has no diabetes, and has a very good body mass, in, um, mass index of 23 kilograms per meter squared. He consulted because he noted a high creatinine level of 170 micromoles per liter. Now, the question is, does he have a chronic kidney disease or is this increase in the serum creatinine the usual presentation of the aging kidneys? So the question now is, is the decline in the kidney function inevitable with aging? Now, let's look at this particular study, a cross-sectional study in Poland of 180 individuals who have no chronic illness, who have normal blood pressures, not on medications, and have normal BMIs. And you can see that there's really barely an increase in the serum creatinine level across ages, both for the male and female participants. So, so you can see that in the healthy aging population, the serum creatinine levels remain within range, but they are always elevated in chronic kidney disease. So not withheld in the information, is that he is a smoker since he was seven, 20, since he was 20 years old. And uh, it has been known that uh, smoking is a risk factor for chronic kidney disease. As you can see in this particular meta-analysis, it is a heterogeneous study. But still, we can still glimpse that you still have run the risk of, uh, of chronic kidney disease among smokers. And this is the potential mechanism for smoking-induced renal damage. Uh, you see smoking with all its heavy metals, hypoxia, intrarenal base constriction, hypertension, prothrombotic pro factors, oxidative stress, pro-inflammatory cytokines, will all lead to increased intramural hypertension, vascular damage, extracellular matrix deposition and fibrosis, leading to tubular dysfunction and atrophy and glomerular sclerosis with progression of chronic kidney disease. So the current guidelines recommend reporting the estimates of glomerular filtration rate. So, and uh, the, the one, uh, recommended by the KDGO in its uh, 2012 clinical practice guideline for the evaluation and management of chronic kidney disease is the chronic kidney disease epidemiology collaboration. And here it used not just, it factored in not just the serum creatinine, but also the gender and the race. So here's the formula for the estimates of the Merler function as um, through the ckd equation. And uh, because of that equation, KDGO came up with a staging of chronic kidney disease. And so here is uh, the staging base on the GFR. And here is also the staging base on the albumin, presence of albumin. Remember that albumin carries an increased risk also for progression of chronic kidney disease. So back to the study on these 180 individuals. If we assess their renal function by using CKD epi, then you can see that there is a progressive and uh, predictable decline in kidney function across uh, throughout the ages. 
And so back to our patient, who is a 75-year-old male, the creatinine of 170 micromoles per liter. So if you use the EGFR equation based on the CKDFP equation, then the estimated GFR is 33 ml per minute. And that means that he is already here in this particular stage of chronic kidney disease. You know? So he's already at stage uh, stage 3, 3B. And if you're going to look at this uh, uh, colors, you can see that he's already at high risk for progression to, to end-stage kidney disease. If we're going to look at the... If we're going to look at the... Another study on a large number of healthy Japanese subjects who received checked up at the Center for Preventive Medicine. And you can see now the, the reference values for the EGFR among the healthy Japanese male and women. And the mean EGFR for their population is 83.7 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared. And if you're going to look at the elderly population, their EGFR is about is between 75 to 80 mils per minute. Okay. Now we did the Philippine survey in 2003 on the estimated, and we studied the estimated GFR of the Philippine population. And as you can see here, there is really a declining kidney function as one ages for both males and females. And for the elderly, the average, the average estimated GFR is between 89, 82 to 89 for 60 to 70 years, and for females about 74 to, 7, to 83, which, is, which closely resembles that EGFR in the Japanese population. So we used creatinine as a marker of GFR. It is endogenously produced from the metabolism of muscle creatinine. The serum levels reflect total body supplies of creatinine and correlate with muscle mass. The excretion rate, however, varies according to body weight and age. For females, it's 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. And for males, it's 20 to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. But there are factors affecting the serum creatinine concentration. And for the elderly, we have to look at their reduced muscle mass. And because of the reduction in muscle mass, there is reduction also in creatinine generation. So another marker for estimates of kidney, of kidney function is being proposed now, and that is cystatin C. Cystatin C is a potent, potent inhibitor of lysosomal proteinases. It is produced by all nucleated cells. It's found virtually in all tissues and fluids. It is freely filtered by the glomeruli, reabsorbed and degraded by the proximal tubule. And most importantly for the elderly, it is not affected by age or muscle mass. And if you're going to compare the estimates of the GFR using cystatin C and creatinine in, this, uh, in the elderly individuals, let us look at this graph. This one will tell is the measurement of actual GFR using iohexol. So this is actual measurement. If we compare the measurement based on creatinine, it somewhat overestimates the kidney function. And if we use the, the cystatin, it somewhat underestimates. But if we use the combination of cystatin C and creatinine in the estimate of kidney function, we can more or less mimic what is the actual measurement. So maybe perhaps for the elderly individual, the use of cystatin C with creatinine will be a better marker in estimating kidney functions. Now the question is, is the decline in kidney function inevitable with aging? And we're going to look at the structural changes in the aging kidney. We're going to look at the microanatomical, which is based on renal biopsy findings, and macroanatomical changes, which is based on imaging studies such as CT scans and such as CT scans. And this data will be coming from studies of healthy living kidney transplant donors with age spanning six decades. The studies of healthy living kidney transplant donors provided us with a unique and ideal information, both the structural 
and ID and functional changes that occur with normal aging because these potential donors are very, very well worked up. They undergo a battery of clinical examinations, testings, and CT scan studies. And during the transplantation before the kidney is implanted, a kidney biopsy is done. So the first, uh, the first change will be that of the changes in the blood vessels, and it's called arteriosclerosis. Okay, so it's the thickening of the, of the vessel wall, eventually will lead to almost occlusion of the, of the lumen. So arteriosclerosis leads to glomerulosclerosis because of ischemic changes. And the main features of ischemic-related changes in the glomerulus are pericapsular fibrosis, wrinkling of the capillary tufts, and progressively thicker basement membrane. The Bowman space then gradually fills with a matrix-like hyaline material, most likely due to disruptive balance between the formation and breakdown of the extracellular matrix in the glomerulus. And finally, the glomerular tufts collapse, leading to development of a globally sclerotic glomeruli. So here are the changes in the glomerulus. So we see here pericapsular fibrosis. Then you have a progressively thicker basement membrane here. Then you have the wrinkling of the capillary tufts, so there. Then you have the Bowman space, which gradually fills with the matrix-like hyaline material. You can see that here. And finally, the glomerulus collapse, leading to development of this globally sclerotic glomeruli. So, because of the sclerosis, this here are two uh, sclerosed glomeruli, and this one normal-looking glomerulus. Uh, because of this uh, glomerulus sclerosis, the tubules then atrophy, and you can see an atrophic uh, tubule here and there's going to be interstitial fibrosis. So the microanatomical features of the, atom, of the aging kidney is called nephrosclerosis. It is made up with the components arteriosclerosis, glomerulus sclerosis, tubular atrophy, and interstitial fibrosis. Now let's look at this, the, macro, the macrostructural changes that occur in the aging kidney, but first let's have a look at the kidney. The kidney has two uh, sections, the cortex here and the medullary area here. Okay? And so what are the components or what are present in the cortex? In the cortex, you have the glomeruli and the proximal tubule and the distal tubule and the peritubular capillaries. In the medullary area, you're collecting tubules. So in the aging kidneys, because of the sclerosis of the glomeruli, the tubules atrophy. Now the remaining nephron, there will be hyperfiltration of the glomerulus and its corresponding nephrons will hypertrophy. And thus, because of this smaller number of intact functioning nephrons, they need to excrete practically the same amount of solutes as in the normal kidneys, and thus the solute excreted per nephron is increased. So what happens then is, here you have a normal kidney. So this is, the, it is your kidney when you're young, but as one ages, you can see you still have, th this line here represents the length of the normal kidney. So as one ages, you can see still the normal length of the kidney. So the, vol the kidney volume does not change, but you can see that the cortex now becomes thinner and there's hypertrophy of the, or increase in the medullary volume. Now, as one becomes, uh, gets older, then there is now a shrinkage in the kidney, a smaller kidney volume. And this is brought about by further uh, thinning of the cortex and now the atrophy of the tubules corresponding to reduction in the medullary volume. The other ch structural change in the kidney is the presence of the renal cyst. And these renal cysts are typically cortical. They have sharp, distinct outline. The cyst wall is characteristically smooth, transparent, avascular, and has a yellowish, bluish, white color and is formed by a thin layer. By ultrasound, you can easily see this cyst. This is, a this is an example of a simple renal cyst. 
It has a hair hairline seam wall, and it has an unechoic content without septa, calcifications, or solid components. So as one ages, the number, the number of simple renal cysts increases. But this is nothing, oh, but this is still compatible with life and does not affect kidney function. Now let's look at case two. Case two is an 80-year-old female who's been hypertensive for five years, but very well controlled with telmisartan and amlodipine. One year ago, her, knee, her neighbor convinced her to take vitamins and supplements, about 12 tablets per day, and this increased her water intake and was told to increase her water intake to 0.5 to 1 liter before and after meals. Now, five days prior to admission, she complained of weakness, dizziness, and vomiting, and she was brought to the emergency room because of depressed sensorium. At the emergency room, she, was, she had a creatinine of 72 micromoles per liter and with an estimated GFR of 67. The serum sodium is really low at 107 millimoles per liter. And so you have a very low calculated serum osmolarity of 225. The normal is about 280. But despite this very low, and, uh, low serum osmolarity, despite this very high postmolar state, the kidneys fail to maximally dilute the urine, and you have now a urine osmolarity, still have a urine osmolarity of 214 milliosmoles per liter. So in the aging kidney, there is loss of the urinary diluting and concentrating capacity. The, the loss of the, the diluting capacity is because of the decrease in GFR, which leads to increase in the proximal renal tubular fluid absorption, a decrease in the tubular delivery of free water to the distal diluting segments. And the consequence of this is that the elderly will be predisposed to hypoosmolality and hyponatremia. On the other hand, there is loss also of the concentrating capacity. And the reason is because there is increase in the medullary blood flow and the washout of the countercurrent, uh, the countercurrent phenomenon. And because of that, there is a decline in maximal urinary concentration from, 100, from 1,100 to 1,200 to just about 400 to 500 milliosmoles. And the consequence of this is that when you have uh, states of dehydration, like diarrhea, vomiting, decreased thirst, and poor oral intake, worsen, there's worsening of dehydration, there's worsening of hyperosmolarity and hypovolemia. Now, the healthy aging kidney and chronic kidney disease share two common characteristics. They both have decreased GFR, and they both have problems with the urine dilution and concentrating capacity. However, there are also differences. For example, in terms of erythropoietin production, since the healthy aging kidney has normal erythropoietin production, then hemoglobin is usually normal, whereas there is anemia in chronic kidney disease from low erythropoietin levels. The serum urea level is normal in the healthy aging kidney, but it's increasing chronic kidney disease. The calcium, magnesium, and phosphates are normal in the healthy, kidney, in the healthy aging kidney, but there is increase in the phosphorus level, decrease in calcium, and more or less normal uh, magnesium levels in chronic kidney disease. In terms of vitamin D and parathyroid hormone, the healthy aging kidneys will have normal production, whereas it is decreased, vitamin D is decreased and PTH is increased in, the, in chronic kidney disease. Urinalysis is normal in the healthy aging kidney, but there's presence, of course, of abnormalities in chronic kidney disease, like hematuria and proteinuria. So what is the clinical significance of the aging kidneys? Those adjustments of medications is needed. Caution with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and contrast agents. There's more, they're more susceptible to acute kidney injury and more severe initial presentation of a truly progressive chronic kidney disease. Their patients will be prone to dehydration or overhydration, and there's increased sensitivity to salt restriction. And for kidney donation, there's really no, no contraindication for a healthy um, individual to donate a kidney. In fact, in the motivated older patients, they can be accepted for, for kidney donation. 
And follow-up of healthy living donors older than 70 years actually had lower mortality rate as compared to the healthy aging controls. Now, how do we take care of the kidneys? The World Kidney Day is a global campaign aimed at raising awareness of the importance of our kidneys to our overall health and at reducing the frequency and impact of kidney disease and its associated problems worldwide. It is celebrated every second Thursday of March. And to place focus on the, uh, on the importance of the kid aging kidneys, in March 2014, the theme was kidneys age, just like you take care of them and talk to your doctor. The World Kidney Day movement has listed eight golden rules, and they are very simple rules for taking care of the kidneys. First, keep fit and active. Second, keep regular control of your blood sugar. Then monitor your blood pressure. Eat healthy and keep your weight in check. Maintain a healthy fluid intake. Do not smoke. I have mentioned already the effect of smoking in the kidneys. Do not take over the counter pills on a regular basis. And get your kidney function checked if you have one or more of the risk factors. You have diabetes, you have hypertension, you're obese. One of, one of your parents or other family members suffers from kidney disease, or you are of African, Asian, or Aboriginal origin. Now let's look at the blood sugar and blood pressure. Here's the Philippine Disease Renal Registry, and it listed the top 10, the top three, and here are the top three causes of end-stage kidney in the Philippines. And you can see diabetic, diabetic nephropathy is the number one cause of end-stage kidney disease, and hypertension, the second top cause of uh, end-stage kidney disease, not just here in the Philippines, but worldwide. And for that, um, the World Kidney Day theme in 2009 was hypertension and kidney disease, a marriage that should be prevented. And the next year, the theme was uh, on, the di on diabetes, protect your kidneys, control diabetes. So if you're diabetic, you should know that your diabetic must be diagnosed early. And um, diagnosis of uh, diabetes is very easy. So just do a uh, blood examinations. Or you can answer a diabetes risk test and ask yourself if you are at risk for type 2 diabetes. For BP management, the KDGO would recommend a BP that is consistently less than or equal to 140 millimeters systolic and less than or equal to 90 millimeters diastolic for the non-potinuric patients and a BP that is consistently less than 130 systolic and less than 80 diastolic for the proteinuric patients. Now, to keep your weight in check, obesity is also a problem and it's related to kidney disease. And in 2017, it is the subject, uh, it is the theme of the World Kidney Day. Now, let's just look, pay attention to the comparison between the metabolically healthy non-obese patients and the metabolically healthy obese patients. And you can see that there is really a very high risk, 79% increased risk of developing chronic kidney disease if there is an increase in the blood, in, in, the, in the body weight. And here is the CKD for pre-survival determination by Kaplan-Mayer analysis. Here is the metabolically healthy non-obese, and here is the metabolically healthy, uh, healthy obese. Okay. In, the, in a large series of um, more than 100,000 patients in the Okinawa Dialysis Registry, you can see that the risk of end-stage kidney disease increases as the BMI increases. However, if you're going to look at the odds of having CKD and end-stage kidney disease, it is more important among the males compared to the females because the risk is much higher. There's really a very distinct entity called obesity-related glomerulopathy, and this is um, uh, and this is described. Physiologic response: there's increase in GFR, renal plasma flow, infiltration fraction, increases in renal tubular absorption of sodium. There's glomerulomegaly. It, the, 
then focal segmental glomerular sclerosis develops, there is subnephrotic proteinuria, and there's absence of nephrotic syndrome even in patients with massive proteinuria. So here is the histologic, one of the histologic features in obesity. Here is the normal glomerulus, and he's a very large glomerulus. Okay. So the next we're going to look at will be a healthy fluid intake. And what is a healthy fluid intake? Again, the hydration is very important, and that is the theme in 2015 of World Kidney Day. But first, let's look at the age-associated abnormalities of water homeostasis. There is a 5 to 10% increase in total body fat and a decrease in total body water of an equal magnitude. And because of this, plasma volume has been shown to decrease by as much as 20% relative to body weight and surface area. And the consequence of this is loss or gain of body shifts will cause clinically significant, of body fluids will cause clinically significant shifts in the concentration of body solutes. And you can see here uh, the elderly and the young who are placed on similar degree of dehydration of water depri deprivation, but you can see that osmolarity is much higher in the elderly compared to the young. And the problem with the elderly subject is that they appear to have higher or smaller set point for thirst. And this loss of an appropriate thirst response compromises the critical compensatory mechanisms responsible for the drive to replace lost body fluid and the only true physiologic means of correcting a hyperosmolar state. So what is a healthy fluid intake? So here's the my pyramid for older adults. And you can see at the base of this is fluid and physical activity for the adults. So elderly patients are prone to dehydration and congestion because of problems with concentrating and diluting mechanisms and the compromised homeostatic mechanism like loss of thirst. Now, the average, in, the, average, the average intake for total water, which includes beverages and food for greater than 50 years adult is 2.7 liters per day for women and 3.7 liters per, per day for men. So that is in the U.S. population. But we all know that fluid needs in healthy older people are variable and greatly influenced by level of physical activity, ambient temperature, and medication use. So the next is do not take over-the-counter pills on a regular basis. And since most of the elderly will be taking non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for joint pains, then we should be very aware that this will cause acute kid, there are two mechanisms, uh, acute and chronic kidney injury. But for acute kidney injury, you have really an acute kidney injury due to reduced renal plasma flow caused by a decrease in the prostaglandins, which regulate vasodilation, the glomerular level, and acute interstitial nephritis, which is characterized by the presence of an inflammatory cell infiltrate in the interstitial of the kidney. And this is caused by an immunological reaction after NSAID exposure of about a week. Now, there's chronic kidney, chronic kidney disease developed in long-term use. And we have already meta-analysis on the effects of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and acute kidney injury. Now, the next, get your kidney function checked if you have one or more of the risk factors. You have diabetes, you have hypertension, you're obese. One of your parents or other family members suffer from kidney disease. And the thing here is now, when are you going to differentiate between age, which is physiologic, and pathologic uh, changes in the kidney? Or in other words, when should you see a nephrologist? Okay. So here's the graph of the, the deterioration of the kidney. Here's, here's for the healthy kidney. Sometime, sometime here, they're going to fall under the current CKD definition. But still, changes that occur with the health in kidney is compatible with life. Now, here you have the deterioration of kidney function with aging and its expected comorbidities. But as you can see, you have a much, much faster decline in kidney function with chronic kidney disease and aging. So the thing to know is that 
define if the decline kidney function is age related or not and how 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 fast is the clean is the decline kidney function based on this particular study the decline kidney function is about 0.6 to 1 ml per year and in the japanese study the decline is similar one about 1 ml per minute per year if you go if you're going to use cystatin c then the decline is about 2 ml per minute per year so it is imperative that elderly the elderly uh, uh the elderly population should receive a routine examination especially the serum creatinine so that the decline in the kidney function can be computed it if it is faster than the normal or the expected rate of decline of kidney function then they have to see a kidney specialist or they have to see their primary physician so to summarize the structural i have discussed with you the structural and functional changes in the human kidneys with aging in the microscopic level you have nephrosclerosis which is made up of global glomerular sclerosis interstitial fibrosis tubular atrophy and arterial sclerosis the functional changes that appear in aging which is a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate the loss of the urinary concentration the leaking capacity decrease in total body water and impaired thirst sensation and here are the gold again the golden rules for taking care of your kidneys thank you for your kind attention Thank you, Dr. Montemayor, for that very comprehensive talk. We now have 535 viewing through Facebook, 88 viewing through YouTube, and 28 viewing through the UPM live stream. The floor is now open for questions from the audience. Just type in your question at the Q&A chat box in the right lower corner of the live stream window or type in comments in YouTube Live or FB at Aging Webinars for Facebook Live users. So for first question, Dr. Montemayor, what causes the formation of renal cysts? Usually it comes, uh, it arises from the diverticulum of the renal tubule. And uh, most of the times because there's an obstruction distal to the tubule. So it's a diverticulum. It's a diverticulum of the tubule. So if uh, an elderly patient comes in with the result of a renal, simple renal cyst in ultrasound or in incidental finding in CT scan, do we have to monitor it? And how frequent do we monitor if it's needed? Well, since it's part of aging, uh, you don't really have to monitor it very frequently. Maybe every year they need evaluation of kidney function. The renal ultrasound should be part of the evaluation. But they should be assured that these are renal symptoms. These are simple renal cysts, and they and this cyst will not affect their kidney function. But are there instances where it can, when it can affect the kidney function, it needs to be removed or unused? Usually, no. We just leave the renal cyst alone. Yeah, they are compatible with life. Yeah, and the most important thing is just to differentiate this, the simple cyst from the complicated cyst. So, for our next question. Why is there a higher risk of kidney disease among Asians and Aboriginals? Is this due to genetics? Or? There are many theories on the yeah, yeah. There are many theories on the on on this, and um, maybe it's genetic, maybe it's um, it's environmental, and maybe because uh, maybe you were born with lesser. With, with lesser nephron numbers because that's also very important. The number, we call that nephron endowment. So maybe there are less nephrons among, among us compared to the other races because maybe we're smaller and uh, they're bigger and so we have lesser nephron numbers. So that does mean that our kidneys can age um, easily faster. faster compared to our Caucasian counterparts? Well, if you're going to compare 
the study is it seems like the rate of deterioration is similar between uh, between races. So so the rate of deterioration is similar, and they have pegged it at one around one ml per meal, per meal per year. So what are uh, what are special about blacks, and why are they included in the equation for the city? Yeah, they have um, they have been found to have the a very fast deterioration of kidney function. So, in fact, one study, the American African study on on kidney disease, would just recruit black because they can easily see the 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 outcomes after several years. It was a study on intensive versus standard blood pressure control, and since they have the the fastest uh, rate of deterioration of kidney function. They, that's why they recruited the blacks. I cannot say with certainty why they have a faster rate of deterioration. Next question from Dr. Canyal. How long is the validity of a creatinine reserve, particularly for contrast studies? What time interval is acceptable? If it's just because of the aging process, I think one year is... is uh, one year is is still acceptable. Yeah, For one year. Kidney. Yeah, because the, the kidney is not going to deteriorate that fast. But of course, we have to understand that sometimes many things happen on the kidneys. There can be an acute process ongoing. And so it is best to get your creatinine just before a contrast studies because we don't know what's happening to the kidneys. Maybe this patient has taken an non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and it has caused an acute kidney injury. So if you're just going to look at the at the at the course of the kidney of the kidney uh, function, then it should be stable. The creatinine should be stable. But of course we just really have to take into account instances like acute kidney injury which might be present and which we, we might not be able to pick up if we don't get the creatinine just before a contrast examination. So in relation to acute kidney injury, particularly in our el elderly patients who are taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, how long or how soon can we repeat the creatinine Say um, to say that it is already resolved, uh, provided we've already stopped the intake of the enzymes. Well, in the elderly individuals, very difficult to say when the kidney function is going to recover after an acute kidney injury because the recovery period is not um, that predictable for them. So can we repeat it after a month or three months? But the, but the thing to do is really to keep on monitoring every week. If there's a, if there is um, if there is a rise in the serum creatinine level, then it has to be monitored more often because you have to pick up improvement or further deterioration, and you might we might miss out the chance to intervene. yeah to intervene if there is a if there's a progressive increase in the creatinine level so as i mentioned earlier there are two presentations acute kidney injury from decrease in the renal blood flow so that's fast then there is acute interstitial nephritis which takes about a week Thank you, Doctora. Another question. How does alcohol intake significantly impact kidney function? Not, not well, I'm, I don't want to say this, but actually not much, except the extra kidney consequences of alcohol intake. Okay, so you can have dehydration, you can have liver injury, you can have rhabdomyolysis, you can have acidosis, but not directly on the kidney, as not directly as not as a direct insult to the kidney. For our next question, when are keto analogs recommended to be taken by our chronic kidney disease patients and how effective is it? Well, um, first we have to start on the diet. For for patients with chronic kidney disease, we can 
so d- depending on the on the GFR level. So for patients with chronic kidney disease, for example, stage three, that means between 30 to 60, they should be placed already on a low protein diet because it's really the protein that is very important here. And this prevents the hyperfiltration of the kidney. But if you place a patient on the low protein diet, and low protein diet is 0.6 grams per kilogram body weight, they have to be pl- the, the kind of protein to be given is that of a high biologic value to supply the essential amino acids. Now, below that, they have to be placed on what we call a very low protein diet. So, very low protein diet means a diet, a protein diet of 0.3 grams per kilogram. And this is a really very restrictive protein diet. And this is the time when they have to be supplemented because even if you give them a high biologic value protein, they will not get enough essential amino acids. So this is the time to give uh, essential to give the essential amino acid plus keto analogs. So the keto analog is to to give the patient the necessary amino acid, which will then be converted to protein in the body in the presence of a very low protein diet. There are many studies already on delaying the the onset of dialysis when the patients are placed on a supplemented very low protein diet. So we are after delaying the initiation of dialysis here because it's already inevitable once the kidney function is very low that patients will really undergo dialysis. And so what we just want to do is to delay dialysis. It is cost effective. For the next question, this is regarding cystatin C. Since you mentioned it earlier, would it be more cost effective than the creatinine test for our elderly patients? Or uh, is it available in most laboratories here in the... It is available in some centers, but still very expensive. But if it's wildly used, then maybe the cost is going to go down. So as of now, creatinine is still the measure for kidney function because it's readily available in almost all laboratory and the cost is not that prohibitive. Eventually, maybe with with more with more uses of cysteine C, the cost may go down, and this may now become the standard of um, this the standard the standard measure of kidney function in the elderly together with the creatinine, because the equation uses both creatinine and cystatin C. Ah, okay. Another question, what is your opinion on the use of statins for lowering blood cholesterol levels that is responsible for developing atherosclerosis? Will it uh, will it outweigh its bad adverse effects to prevent atrophy or collapse of the glomeruli and other kidney disease as one ages? The use of statin in the pre-dialytic patient is beneficial. Uh, many there are studies already on the use of statins in the pre-dialytic patient. So yes, we can. We need to use statins. We need to lower down the lipid levels. For the dialytic patient, that it's really another story because many studies have shown that there is really no benefit between statins and placebo among patients on dialysis. So if we have patients on dialysis, can we forego the, yeah. the statins even if the patient is post? Uh-huh. Them? Now, the guideline post says, them? yeah, the guideline says that if the patient is on statin, then just continue with the statin. But if the patient has not is not on statin, then don't start the statin anymore. That, that's, the, that's the guideline for the use of statin. So how is nephrolithiasis managed in an elderly patient since we cannot over or under hydrate the patient? If the patient was found to have kidney stones or nephrolithiasis, um, in, in younger patients, we usually advise increasing fluid intake to increase the, ur- the urine output. But how about for our aging population? Um, I, I, I did not show this slide on the adequate intake for the for the general population. But actually, 2.7 is an adequate intake for females from the ages 19 to more than 70 years old. 
and 3.7 liters for the males. So the the adequate intake is similar actually compared to the young, except that they have to to drink on a regular basis, no, in the, not binge on the water. So hydration, yes, still the is still the uh, is still the one of the measures to to prevent stone formation. But of course, there are other modalities, medical medical management for stone dissolution, which you can give. In relation to that, uh, to stone formation, does calcium intake or calcium supplements predispose to stone formation in the elderly? The usual calcium, no. It's only when you have uh, large amounts of calcium. The thing is that if you, in fact, withdrawing calcium is not good because calcium binds the oxalates and oxalates are the um, one of the culprit for stone formation. So if among patients who have stone, the usual intake of calcium as a supplement is not contraindicated. Is it normal to urinate 50 to 60 ml every hour for a 95-year-old patient? The urinalysis of this patient is actually normal. This is one question from her. Yeah, the thing is that uh, the, the elderly may have problems with um, control, with the voluntary control of urination, and therefore, because of the because of the weakness of the external sphincter muscles, then they are unable to voluntarily control micturition, and that's why they urinate more frequently. Another question for Doctora for regarding the kidney stones. Do uh, do patient, elderly patients with renal calcinosis eventually require dialysis? No, just calcinosis. Not cal calcinosis is an is a non-obstructing stone, so it's not usually a cause of end stage kidney disease. And so, for that particular patient, maybe there are other comorbidities that uh, that led to the development of end-stage kidney disease. Especially, for example, she might be hypertensive, she might be diabetic. So these are more important causes of end-stage kidney disease rather than calcinosis. Another question, Paul, does drinking whey protein for weight gain or muscle building for a long time can uh, destroy your kidneys? Or can inc or um, increase the progression of uh, decline in kidney function. Well, whey protein. If you a high protein diet causes hyperfiltration, and hyperfiltration accelerates glomerulosclerosis. So, if you're taking a very very high protein diet, then there is going to be a more accelerated uh, glomerulus. So is sclerosis it, of the glomerulus. So our, our um, bodybuilders or our uh, patients who often go to the gym for muscle building, are they really at risk for a faster kidney decline? Well, kidney I, have, well decline? I have several patients who would have elevations in the creatinine and they are, you know, they are bodybuilders who are taking this, uh, this uh, high-protein diet. So is it not um, compensated by increase in, in the, the water intake? Water no. intake and excretion of your um, creatinine? No, no, no. Increase in the water intake is not going to, to cure your kidney problem. If, if you're a kidney problem, it's not going to cure. Increase in the water intake is not going to cure it. So how do we advise, doctora, our patients who are very keen on building muscles? Um, I think you just really have to follow pain. guidelines. And if you're going to look at the recommendations, actually the recommendation for a normal protein intake is just about 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. No? You can go to yeah, just 0.8. That's adequate. That's considered adequate intake of proteins. So if you go higher than that, uh, you're going to cause some changes in the kidneys. And as I said, hyperfiltration. You generate a lot of waste 
a, way, a lot of waste matters, which the kidneys have to handle also when, you, you, when you're on a high-protein diet. Next question from one of our viewers. Is there a possibility of nephrogenesis as a form of kidney remodeling in humans? I don't know. We don't have anything yet in the pipeline for uh, regeneration of kidneys. So still we consider the, the, the kidney, we still are there in the kidney endowment uh, theory that whatever nephrons you have, at birth will be the same nephron numbers you have. But of course, but of course there will be attrition because of glomerulosclerosis as you age. So we have a question here, actually seems like an, a consult for, uh, from one of our audience. Kahit po ba umiinom ng prednisone and other medications ang may lupus for almost three or more years, wala naman daw diabetes, kidneys are healthy by monitoring, pero nakaka two to three glasses naman every day, kahit may extra salty food, masisira pa rin ba ang kidneys? The thing is that you have very distinct lesions in lupus, especially if you have lupus nephritis. So there's there's fibrosis, there's sclerosis. So the the it's a pathologic process. So it's a pathologic process. Is voluntary restraint of uh, urination a risk factor if habitually done among our elder patients? Manapipigil po ng ibig. Well, most of the time you cannot really, con you know, there comes a point when micturition, the micturition reflex becomes very strong and therefore there's really this very strong urge to micturate, to micturate. So for those who cannot do that, that means maybe they have already a neurogenic bladder and this neurogenic bladder is the one that predisposes to kidney to kidney, to kidney injury because of the reflux and recurrent UTI. So yung mga nagpipigil, for example, you can only make pigil to a certain degree after which, you know, the urge to urinate is really very strong and you really have to empty the bladder. And when you empty the bladder, you flush out already all the bacteria that's in there if there is no retention. What is the advisable medication therapy for a hypertensive patient with microalbuminuria in the UV? Well, for the for for those with already with microalbuminuria, we would of course we would recommend uh, either an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker because they can they have been shown to cause reduction in proteinuria and give kidneys better protection compared to the other antihypertensive medicines. One question about kidney transplant. Um, can you give us, doctor, a maximum age for one to benefit from a renal transplant? Since um, elderly are not routinely, routinely placed in the kidney weight. Well, I really don't have um, a cap on the age of the patient. For as long as the patient is healthy, he can undergo kidney transplant. And healthy means still having good blood vessels, good heart, and good, good uh, cerebral function. So I, I really don't place a cup. And in fact, we have mentioned earlier that uh, even elderly can donate the kidneys, no? provided that they are very healthy. And they would need to undergo a battery of tests to prove that. So what can you advise for a patient, a 65-year-old patient with nephrolithiasis on the left and a high creatinine of 265? Is um, this patient prone to undergo dialysis or can we control and prevent further kidney damage? Patient is also alcoholic and a smoker. Well, a, a creatinine, the, the nephrolithiasis on the left may, may just be an incidental finding because the creatinine is really not going to go up if you have a healthy one kidney. 
So this other kidney is going to take over the function of the deceased kidney. So it means that if you have a creatinine of 200 and above, both kidneys are already damaged. And so since both kidneys are damaged, one has a nephrolithiasis, it might not even be obstructing. The stone will may, may just be there, an incidental finding. So just still have to look for the reasons why the creatinine is elevated, not just focus on the nephrolithiasis. And also smoking is a risk yeah, factor. Yeah, smoking is a risk eating. factor. And this patient may also be hypertensive, maybe diabetic, maybe taking NSAID. So you just really have to go through the history and find out the reason for the elevation, the creatinine, and the involvement of both kidneys. Are fish oil supplements helpful for the aging kidneys? And is it safe for kids five years and up? Uh, we, don't, we don't really have definite studies on, the, on fish oil. It has been studied on a certain kind of glomerulonephritis. So we give that, that as a form of therapy for, for a certain kind of glomerulonephritis. But uh, so far, as a general rec recommendation, we don't really give it. Last question. Can you still have time for the last question? Yes, chronic UTI or chronic or repetitive UTI is a common complaint among the elderly. So mm -hmm. how do we manage this um, repeated bouts of urinary tract infection? First, determine whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. Second, determine whether there are structural changes in the bladder that needs to be corrected. So for example, do they have a neurogenic bladder? Do they have, um, and that's one of the, the reasons for the recurrent UTI. But other than that, uh, there, are, there is a guideline on the treatment of recurrent urinary tract infection among the elderly. If they are, there's no fever, no leukocytosis, and it's just really some, some past cells in the urine, then we just really have to observe. So treat accordingly, treat as necessary. So when do you treat when the patient presents with fever or presents with uh, uh, general body malaise? So treat according to sensitivity. Unfortunately, that was the that will be the last question due to time constraints. Thank you so much for all those questions. And once again, thank you, Dr. Beth. Montemayor for enlightening, enlightening us with your answers. So in summary, we learned from the webinar today that kidneys also get older, okay? And there's two common characteristics among patients with the health, healthy elderly patients who have aging kidneys and chronic kidney disease patients. So they both have decrease in the estimated GFR and also a decrease in the concentrating ability. But... Uh, for the healthy aging kidneys, their function remains intact. So you have the erythropoietin function, the electrolyte function is still normal for this patient. Okay, so elders and aging kidneys are prone to drastic and sudden changes in fluid and nutritional intake. So we have to be particular on that. And maintaining a healthy lifestyle really goes a long way in not only preventing comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, and obesity, but also caring for our kidneys. With that, we would like to thank again Dr. Elizabeth Montemayor for taking time out of her busy schedule and sharing with us her expertise on the aging kidneys. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Please join us again on September 27, that's a Friday, for Lung Cancer in the Elderly by our very own Dr. Belia Sashoko. We would also like to acknowledge our role of donors for the 85th anniversary of the Mu Sigma Phi sorority. And please also join the UP Med webinars every Wednesday. Join us for a night of wonderful music on September 21, 7 p.m. at the PICC as we pay tribute to the National Artist for Music and Ramon Magsaysay Awardee, Mr. Ryan Kayabiab. This musical tribute will feature the country's best performers with a 50-piece ABS-CBN Philharmonic Orchestra playing an all-Kayabiab repertoire, all for the benefit of the UP College of Medicine as it embarks on its most ambitious 
struck infrastructure project to date, the construction of the 11-story medical sciences building. Get your tickets now at ticketworld.com.ph. The Aging and Longevity Medical Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority would like to thank our partners, the UP College of Medicine, UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. We are also grateful to support from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, UP Manila Information Management Service, and DOST ASTI, and the PRC Board of Nursing. Most of all, we thank you, our participants, for spending your lunch hour with us. To receive your certificates of attendance, kindly answer the evaluation through the link that will be sent to your email addresses after you sign the attendance sheet for today's webinar. The certificates will then be emailed to your registered email addresses within two to four weeks. Here is a quick view of the schedule of our upcoming webinars. For more details and updates, please check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash agingwebinars and our Twitter timeline at twitter.com slash agingwebinars. Today's webinar recording and all webinar recordings may be viewed at YouTube at Aging Webinars channel. We are also announcing the launch of the OB Pearls book. Get your copies now. Thank you and have a great day. Before we end, let us serenade you with some Christmas songs composed by the National Artist and Ramon Magsaysay Awardee, Mr. Ryan Kayabyab, and sung by the UP Medical Alumni Society Choir. Coming spirit of Christmas, tonight, we will have the Upmas Choir accompanied by Maestro Ryan Kayabyab, bringing us the joy of Christmas with two of Miss Maestro Kayabyab's original compositions. Ladies and gentlemen, the Upmas Choir and Maestro Ryan Kayabyab. Sanggol, kalung-kalung ng iyong ina. Munting sanggol, may ningning ang iyong mga ma. Thank you. 